I have a bit of a, a, a special program today. Coming up in a few minutes, we're going to be joined by a couple of representatives from local law enforcement agencies. They, they join us on Thursday mornings normally as it is, and we'll talk about some of the things that, uh, that normally do come up, safety tips, looking for various people who are wanted by the law in the area, uh, there are their activities going on at the local fairs and the like. But the main reason we have two of them in today is because we've had so much developing over the last couple of weeks with law enforcers being shot at, gunned down, sometimes execution style across the country. And I'd really like to get the take on, uh, on, on what the job is really like from a law enforcement perspective and maybe start bringing some sanity back into this conversation, which seems to be lost because of this Black Lives Matter issue. That's coming up in a few minutes. In the meantime, I wanted to, to jump off the, uh, the diving board today, if we could, by mentioning a photograph that has been dominating the Drudge Report for about the last 12, 15 hours. And it's a photograph out of Turkey. A little boy, must be about four years old, uh, drowned on a beach. There with his shorts and shoes on and a t-shirt. And then there's a second photograph of, a, of a, what apparently is a Turkish policeman picking up the lifeless corpse and carrying the little boy, uh, the little boy's uh, a corpse away from the beach. And this apparently is tugging at the heartstrings of people all across Europe and even North America. And it's a supposedly an, an emotional plea, and it's, it comes down to that. It's an emotional argument for refugee programs, that is, migrants and resettlement and the like. And people are saying, aha, see, if you're opposed, then you must want these little children to die. They drowned at sea. You're perfectly happy with that. We could be saving them but for you and your opposition. You know how that's going to work, don't you? 57. Eight minutes after eight o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. So I happened to see that last night and it was still there, that photograph still topping the Drudge Report today, but it raises a question. Turkey is a really big country. It's also an Islamic country. It is a it is not a wealthy country by the standards, let's say, of some parts of Central and Western Europe and North America, but it's a wealthy country. It's not a it's not a poor country that is in the third world by any means. Turkey is a modern country, has been for a century. So why aren't the Turks taking in all of these refugees? Saudi Arabia is a wealthy country, very wealthy because of the oil that it, uh, the oil wealth it's been using to uh, to build up its reserves for the last forty or fifty years. Why aren't the Saudis taking more of these Muslim refugees? You look around the Middle East, you've got Dubai, you've got Qatar, you've got the United Arab Emirates. These are not poor countries by any means. Why aren't they taking the refugees? If you go over into Southeast Asia, Malaysia has a large Muslim population. Malaysia, Malaysia is actually a very advanced society. It could well take these refugees. So why is it that we are being told, well, because of your opposition in the West, the little boys are drowning, and look at this sad, sad picture. And that's because of you. You're responsible for his death. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> You've got countries all over that part of the world who could be stepping up and they could be playing a much larger role, but they aren't. Why is it we never talk about that particular angle to all of this? It seems to me that we're being played if we do not ask these other countries why they aren't stepping up and doing their part. Also, I happened to come across this before I was uh, coming into work this morning, eating my breakfast, decided to peruse the computer at home and came across this from the Daily Caller. Headline, U.S. Kills Afghan Refugee Program Funding, Citing Corruption. Now, it makes you wonder if there's corruption in all of these refugee programs or just the Afghan one. A writer says, U.S. State Department officials stopped funding training of Afghanistan's Ministry of Refugees and Repatriation due to chronic corruption and lack of capabilities, according to the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Re Reconstruction in a report made public Thursday. The U.S. has spent nearly $1 billion on Afghan refugee aid since 2002, largely through organizations like the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the International Committee of the Red Cross. A U.N. Office of Inspector General investigation discovered that the, the program spent about $117,000 in United Nations funds for staff bonuses, reimbursements to officials supported by forged documents, and an office rental that violated both the United Nations rules and Afghan laws. 
So people are getting rich off refugee resettlement. Who knew? I mean, you know, and, and then I got a I got a note last night from someone explaining that the local newspaper is going to have what they are calling a uh, a nonpartisan discussion about all of this, September twenty second, sponsored by the Times News, and they're going to have a panel put together that will answer the public's questions so that the public will know more about this program. Well, they they may be a panel of people who actually, calling them unbiased would be ridiculous because most of the people involved are getting a check because of this program. Well, it's, how can you put this together and say, oh, this is going to be uh, you know, a panel where we're going to be objective and offer all sorts of views? No, what you're here to do is you're here to sell the program to the local and growing opposition, and the overwhelming majority of people in the Magic Valley don't want it. They haven't invited anyone to join the panel who might be in opposition to the program. How can this be an unbiased effort on the part of the newspaper? It isn't. They're selling the propaganda. They're not reporting the news. They're selling the program. That's, that's something that I think is just so absolutely underhanded. And yet to try to present this as if somehow uh, this, is going to, uh, this is simply going to answer all of our questions and everyone will leave going, Gee willikers, I wonder why I ever was opposed to this program. But no, they haven't invited anybody from the local committee that has been organizing these, these demonstrations counter, counter arguments. No one has been invited to participate on that panel. You've got someone from the State Department. The State Department has a stake in selling the refugee resettlement program. And then you have a lot of people with the program and with the College of Southern Idaho. Ka-ching, ka-ching. Hello. 814. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And I came across this at the Daily Signal today. You got to do your reading, folks. The majority of immigrants in the U.S. receive some form of government welfare, significantly outpacing native born Americans who use benefit programs, according to a study released Wednesday. The Center for Immigration Studies, a nonprofit organization that advocates for decreased immigration, reported that 51% of immigrant households used at least one welfare program in 2012 versus 30% of native-born households. Stephen Camerata, the center's director of research and author of the report, said one of his most surprising findings was the sharp increase in welfare use among households with children. He found that 76% of immigrant-led households with children receive welfare, contrasted with 52% of native-born. And, and who's, who's actually footing the bill for all of this? Well, the college will make money. The refugee resettlement program will make money. The Lutheran Church will make money. All of these other, uh, these other organizations that help with the resettlement, they'll all make money. But you, as a taxpayer, will be funding these people's free ride for who knows how long, months, year and a half. Does, does it strike you that perhaps your opinion should count? And that someone should, if they're having a panel discussion? invite some of you to participate? Apparently not. Meanwhile, speaking of refugee and immigrant issues, last night Bill O'Reilly got into a bit of a snit on his program on the Fox News channel, The O'Reilly Factor, with Jorge Ramos. Ramos is the man who got into a, a bit of a peeing match with Donald Trump a couple of weeks ago. Ramos also claims to be a journalist, just like the folks over at the Times News do. But O'Reilly said, no, I don't think so. I think that you're more of a commentator than a journalist. Take a listen. You're an anchor man. How can you possibly cover illegal immigration fairly when you're an activist, when you're, you're a proponent of allowing them amnesty? You should excuse yourself from it or recuse yourself from it. I'm, or I'm just become a up, reporter. Or become like me, a commentator. I'm just a reporter. You're not. Asking questions. You're an activist. Mr. O'Reilly, I don't think you are the right person to lecture me on advocacy and journalism when you spend most of your program I'm a commentator, giving opinions that's what I do. Without asking questions. Jorge, why don't you just become Bill. like me, a commentator? You're not a newsman anymore. You're an advocate now. I, I am simply a reporting asking questions, uh, but sometimes as a reporter, you have to take a stand when it comes to racism, discrimination, corruption, right. public lies, dictatorships, and human rights. You have to take a stand, and that's the only thing I'm Nobody doing. Nobody has ever been in 
the repertorial range like you have been. And I'm not criticizing you for your stand. I'm saying you're in the wrong job. Be a commentator. Now, no, I got to tell think everybody. That what Donald Trump is doing is very right. dangerous. He's proposing that's the largest opinion. mass deportation in recent history. Jorge, and who is going to challenge opinion. him? And that's our job as reporters. You know, your job as a reporter, sir, is to report the facts. I used to do that. Like Bill O'Reilly, I moved on. Now I offer opinion. I'm no longer objective, I am subjective. And Ramos is in denial if he cannot also see that. As are people, let's say, oh, at a local newspaper, the Magic Valley Times News. They would obviously be in denial as well as they work the propaganda effort to promote the refugee resettlement program in this community. Where is it that they ever ask the question, what's the downside of this? Just like the story they did Sunday about Jerome. Oh, isn't it great? We have all of these newcomers here from Guadalajara, from Baja, from Tijuana, from... Excuse me, are they here legally or illegally? Well, we didn't want to ask that question. It might offend somebody. But is it good for the community? Well, we, we believe so. Well, no, wait a second. Let's go ask a few other people around town and find out how conditions are, let's say, versus where they were 20 years ago. What is wrong with you people? Do your jobs. Stop trying to sell us a bill of goods and tell us, uh, telling us that you know better about all of this. Bill Colley with you. This is Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 818.57. Going to be a bit cooler today. If you're going to the fair, this is really a good day to do it. Uh, you'll be walking around in temperatures. Oh, mid to upper 70s, and, and believe me, you'll feel a lot more comfortable, I suppose, than if it was. There are some years, I'm told, when the fair, the temperature is in that triple-digit range, and it's just not pleasant to be out there walking around, you know, unless you find something that's got a breeze going through it and maybe a shelter, you know, a roof over the top. In the meantime, we've got some guests coming up who are going to be talking some law enforcement issues with us, specifically some of the dangers involved in the jobs and how their jobs and how those may be heightened by a lot of the recent rhetoric coming out of Washington as well as Black Lives Matter. I do want to point out, uh, we have several people who've joined our program recently and are really doing a wonderful job. Uh, they, they have joined us, and, and they are doing wonderful work in this community as well. And I think they've done this because they know the show has a great reach. One of those is high desert meat processing, where they process one animal at a time. What you bring in is what you're going to get back. Darren Van Horn, owner of High Desert Meat Processing in Twin Falls, has over 30 years' experience in the meat business. We would recommend you visit High Desert Meat and, and visit, in fact, its Facebook page where you can see recommendations from customers. You can give High Desert Meat Processing a call for all of your wild game and domestic processing needs, 734-9949. I'll give you that number again in a moment. High Desert Meat does in-house smoking, nothing gets shipped out, specialty meats, jerky, pepperoni, salami, summer sausage, kielbasa, breakfast sausage, brats, Polish dogs, hot dogs, and much more, USDA approved. Darren works closely with local beef growers and their programs to ensure quality meat. Again, the number, 734-9949. 20 after 8 o'clock, 57. Plenty more coming up.